The ages were around two and a half. How long did you study the kids for? You never do studies that are that long when you have two-year-olds. So this was a study that was a kind of one and done, and the children came in and they play in the playroom that you see over here. And then we ask them to go into another room with their parents. And then the parents are asked to teach their children two words. Now it turns out that these are the same two words that we know they can learn. When you have a live person talking to another little live person who's a child. And we also know that when you just have these two words on television, the child isn't going to learn those words from television. And we also know that when you do FaceTime with the same two words, the children learn them. So what would happen now if you had a live conversation with a kid, but in the middle of one of those two words, you interrupted it with a cell phone call? Does the child still learn from the live interactions? Or when they're interrupted, does it cut it off? And the child thinks, ha, ah, no longer for me, and doesn't learn the word at all. Now, we hypothesized that the child would learn better in that live back and forth conversation, that serve in return, because that's how kids learn best. That's how children master language when it's meaningful to them and when the timing is right. And we thought, hmm, since we have a lot of studies showing that if the timing is preserved, they learn, what would happen if the timing wasn't preserved? That's what we did and we found out. The child doesn't learn the word when it's interrupted and does learn the word when you have a conversation. The very first time that you saw the hypothesis proved, the first child that proved this, mm -hmm. um, how did you feel when you saw that? You prove nothing in research because it's not what research is about. But what it does is it, you have a hypothesis, you have a hunch about the way the world works. And you look at children to tell us what's really going on. You take the fire in their eyes and say, teach me. I'm an adult and they want to understand you. So how do we feel? I kind of expected this because I feel the same way. When I'm at dinner and I'm with my adult children and they look down like this and they think that I'm not noticing that they're checking their texts, well, I'm noticing. And my response to that is, gosh, I guess you think that text is more important than your mom. And if I feel that way as an adult, or if I watch people when they're standing at Starbucks and they pull out a phone and they're not looking at the barista on the other side, to me that still counts as rude. So I wondered if kids noticed it too. When that cell phone rang during this experiment and research, uh -huh. what kind of expressions did the children have on their faces? Well, you know, at first the children think it's inconsequential. At first they think mom is surely going to continue the conversation with them. And then they find out that mom's distracted. And we ask the mothers to be distracted. And when they find out for real that it's been cut, that that back and forth conversation isn't fluid anymore, they start to get a little upset. They either look elsewhere, or sometimes kids will just come banging and banging and banging, trying to get the mother's attention. But let's elevate this to a higher level. This isn't just about cell phones. This is about the very learning of language itself. This is the science of telling us how young children learn language through a socially gated brain. That means that we learn from other human beings in conversation. And there's a lot of research to suggest that when the conversation is preserved, children learn just fine, even on FaceTime. But when you break that contingency, when you break that natural back and forth, then the child and the parent are no longer singing what I call the conversational duet. You can't sing a conversational duet with just one person. The duet requires two. This was strictly cell phone interruption, but right. would it be applicable to any kind of interruption? Yeah, that's a great question, and we actually looked at that. Uh, Jessa Reed who is now at Ohio State and who is an amazing researcher on this project. Um, this is really her baby. 
and she looked to see what kind of interruptions were problematic. The interruptions that are problematic are not, you both look over because someone walks in the room. You both look over and change what's going on because the doorbell rang. It's when one person breaks it, all right? When one person violates the expectation, then it's harder to bring everybody back in. The lassoing doesn't work as well. And parents try because they realize it's been broken after the cell phone call, and so they try to bring it back. And by gosh, they can't. Not the same as when they both look over. Not the same as when they both attend to something on the radio. Almost in all cases, when that cell phone interrupted, they did not learn that word, even though that's a word that they could easily master. Oh yeah, no, we know they can learn it because we've seen them learn those very same words live before. But when you break it, when you crack the conversation, you can't sing the conversational duet anymore. And without that conversational duet, children don't learn language. Based on this, what would you see as your next step in research or the next thing that you would do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we want to explore these conversational duets a little bit more. We want to understand the meaningfulness, the timing of it. There's a lot of good research out there already showing us that this is a critically important piece. But as we elevate it, there's one more thing to note. And that is, we've talked a lot about the quantity of the conversation and how that quantity could reduce the 30 million word gap. But it's not just about quantity. What this kind of research shows us is it's about the quality as well. And preserving that conversation is what matters. As researchers, we want to understand that a little bit better. What works, what doesn't work, and why. And what you just mentioned, was it the 30 million word gap? What is that? There were some wonderful uh, research by Hart and Risley back in 1995. And it's become almost uh, popular vernacular at this point. It's called the 30 million word gap. And what we found, or what they found, is that folks from lower socioeconomic um, environments uh, hear much less language coming past the ears of their children than children, at least in this study, from upper income environments. Now, what we found since then is that this doesn't have to do with SES at all. There are some parents who tend to use a lot more and higher quality language with their children whether they're rich or whether they're poor, whether they're from the United States or somewhere else. And it turns out that those parents who use the richer quality, which generally is coupled with more language, well, they're the ones whose children have higher vocabularies years later. When you were watching the experiments take place, uh -huh. was the parrot ever able to get the child back on track to learn the word? Well, you know, that's what we're best at. Um, we are the ultra-social species, so saith my colleague Mike Tomasello. And that means that we're particularly sensitive to social cues, right? And we're sensitive when somebody's not looking at us and not caring about us, uh, or someone else is stressed. We pick up that information. So as little people, it doesn't surprise me at all when I watch these little people that they know when somebody's paying attention or not. It's like that kid on the, on, you know, who's on the jumping board or the diving board at the pool and goes, Mom, look, Mom, look. Boy, they know if Mom's looking or Mom isn't looking or Dad is looking or Dad isn't looking. They love to be noticed and who doesn't? What yes. tips would you offer for parents based on the research that you gathered? It's actually somewhat easy. It's look at what your kid is looking at and comment on it. Your child is scanning this vast new environment. And while it may seem ordinary to us, it's all new to our children. And if we respect them enough to comment on what they're looking at, we help build their language, we build their attention, and we build their self-esteem. Educational background, undergrad, grad, and PhD. The undergrad, University of Pittsburgh, graduate school, University of Pennsylvania, and what did you want to know? And PhD. PhD was University of Pennsylvania.